Romans. And we will begin tonight with a fast review to set our stage for our subject matter tonight. A fast review of chapter five. Now, groundwork. Remember, Romans as a letter is fundamentally a doctrinal letter. It's a teaching letter from start to finish, which means that it's not focused like uh, the letter to the Galatians, like the letters to the Corinthian church uh, on correcting problems. Now, Paul does correct some problems, but that's not the focus. It is a, a theological treatise, if you will, from start to finish. It's more like the, the book of Hebrews in that respect. The key thought, the key statement in the entire book, chapter 1, verses 16 and 17, I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ, for it is the power of God to salvation to everyone who believes, to the Jew first and also to the Greek. Now stop there for just a moment. That's the theme of the whole letter. Right there in one statement, one sentence in verse 16. This is the thing that the Christians in the church at Rome, like the Christians in the church at Antioch of Syria, like Christians elsewhere seemingly, were tussling over, were struggling with in the 20 years after the events of Acts chapter 2, in that window of time, you might say, between the beginning of the church and the beginning of writing down the gospel, the writings of the books of Matthew and Mark and Luke and so forth in the first uh 25 or 30 years of the existence of the church. During this time, as the gospel spreads, just as Jesus described in Acts chapter 1, from Jerusalem to Judea to Samaria and then to the uttermost parts of the earth, the Jewish Christians, the original Christians, some of them are going to struggle as the gospel goes outside the boundaries of Judaism into the Gentile world. There is delicious irony in the idea that the gospel goes from Jerusalem to Judea, not to the uttermost parts of the earth, but Judea to Samaria, to the area populated by people that were the most despised by many Jews of all non-Jewish people, and then to the rest of the world as well. So they seem to struggle with this idea as the gospel is being revealed, as the New Testament is being written down, Paul writes in part to address that and explain to these Roman Christians the basis of salvation. What's the basis of salvation? Faith in Christ, the very thing that the gospel teaches. The basis of salvation is not from the Gentile pagan perspective to be an ideal individual, to be that perfect man that the Greek philosophers tried to describe. The basis of salvation is not, as the Pharisees particularly wanted to enforce on everybody else, your relationship to God back through Abraham, through the flesh. And it certainly is not your relationship to God on the basis of the law. As we saw in chapter 4, Paul emphasized that the relationship through Abraham came 400 plus years before the law was ever brought in. So the theme, the whole point, chapter 1, verse 21, salvation revealed through the gospel is by faith in Christ. This is the mystery that Paul was talking to the Galatians about in Galatians chapter 3. And we'll come to that later in the class. But notice the statement, verse 17, for in it, therein, in the gospel, is revealed the righteousness of God. From faith to faith, as it is written, the just shall live by faith. Now, in chapter 5, after Paul has introduced this whole discussion, this whole issue, as it were, among some of these Christians, in chapter 5 now, he begins to, to get down to brass tacks, and in the first four verses, he talks about justification by faith. Since we have been justified by faith. We're not justified by works of the law. We're not justified by our heritage 
traced back to Abraham. We're not justified by being that ideal concept of a man that the philosophers presented. How are we justified? By faith in Christ. We're justified by faith. Therefore, what do we have? The result, peace with God. Justification is the key concept in the New Testament in many ways. It relates to how we are brought back into a right relationship with God. Synonyms used in the New Testament would include words like saved and reconciled and redeemed. It results from faith. But notice what Paul does not say. We're not justified by faith alone. He never couples faith with that concept of faith by itself. Go over to James chapter 2, and you do find the only passage in the entire Bible that couples those two ideas together. And what does James tell us? Salvation is not by faith only. Martin Luther, it is said, struggled to understand the book of Romans as a Roman Catholic priest because he struggled to find justification by works as Catholicism taught it in the Middle Ages and couldn't find it there. And then he finally came to Romans 1 and verse 17. Aha, I have found it. Faith, faith alone. The problem was Luther didn't read Romans 1 verse 5 and Romans 16 verse 26, which puts that faith in context, the obedience of faith, the activity, the action of faith. Well, at verse 2 in chapter 5, verses 2, 3, and 4, he talks about the, the blessings of being justified. We have access to heaven's favor. We have the ability to stand and to, to reason. Uh, we have reason to hope. We have reason to look forward and anticipate in a positive way. Why? Because we have been justified. What does justification then do for us? It enables patience. It enables character. It enables us to hope even in the face of tribulation, according to verses 3 and 4. So that brings us then to verses 5, 6, 7, and 8 in chapter 5. And he says, hope, the anticipation that's based on evidence God has provided, verse 5, is our reason for continuing on. God has given us a reason. At exactly the right moment, he sent forth Jesus Christ. The statement in verse 6, in exactly the right moment, God sent forth his son as he would write to the Galatians in Galatians 4 and verse 4. Now, he gives us this, this scenario, this, this conundrum. Would someone die for a righteous man? Remember, we talked about that. What's the definition of a righteous man in this particular context? As Paul is writing this in part for the benefit of Jewish Christians, Christians with a Pharisee background, basically. What's the definition of a righteous man? Someone who has done exactly, precisely what the law prescribed. Not one bit more, not one bit less. Someone who, in essence, has approached the requirements of God as if they were a checklist and crossed off everything on the list. I've done exactly what you said. Think of it as minimum requirement salvation. No extra mile, no extra effort. I've done the bare minimum necessary. And what's Paul's point here at verse 7? Would you want to take that guy's place in judgment? Would you want to face God basically saying, okay, I've done the bare minimum necessary for you to owe me salvation? But then he goes on in chapter seven, uh, in, in verse 7 of chapter 5. Perhaps for a good man, some would even dare to die. What's the good man? Who's the good man in this scenario? Say again. Okay, the guy who's gone above the minimum. He's not just met the minimum requirements. He's, he's done extra credit, you might say. He's gone over and above. Some might dare to die for him, but God demonstrates his love for us how? Verse 8, while we were still in sin, still condemned, hopeless in our own right, Christ died 
for us. God is able and willing to do for us what we cannot do for ourselves, provide that perfect sacrifice. That perfect sacrifice in verse 8, by the way, stands in sharp contrast to passages like Hebrews chapter 10 and verse 4, where the blood of bulls and goats, it could not take away sin. It was impossible for those things in their own right to take away sin. It depended on the ultimate sacrifice of Jesus. So come into verses 9, 10, and 11 in chapter 5, and Paul talks about the power of the blood of Jesus, the effectiveness that it and it alone possesses. I had a conversation uh, some years ago with a couple who, who began to visit with us there in, in Fayetteville, and after several Bible studies, uh, they finally just came out and, and asked, why the emphasis on blood? And I kind of had to back up and, and, and ask, what do you mean? Well, the, the, the songs that, that y'all sing, what can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And, and, and in this study, you keep talking about the, the, the sacrificial blood. of. Lo and behold, this couple came from a background, a, a supposedly Christian uh, denominational background, where the, the theology took almost no notice of the blood of Jesus. The idea of salvation presented to them is that God has done this for you of his own choice, and, and he's given you this, and that's all there is to it. No consideration, really, of what it cost heaven to make this possible. So Paul begins this, this thought in chapter 5 with an expression that he's going to repeat three more times just in rapid succession. Much more than, in verse 9, uh, since we have now been justified by his blood, much more shall we be, be saved by his life. In other words, if this is sufficient to balance the scales, the blood of Jesus, to bring us back into a, a justified, a right relationship with God, then the fact that Jesus lives that he didn't die and stay dead, but the fact that he arose, overcame the power of death, much more shall we be saved by his life. That expression, much more, is a declaration of assurance. In verse 9, verse 10, verse 15, verse 17, the offering that empowers our justification, Jesus' blood, answers and more than answers every claim of, against us for satisfaction by God. We're reconciled by his death, therefore we're saved by his life, verse 10. And the result, verse 11, what do we do as a result? We glory. We rejoice. We exult in God. And then at verse 12, for the rest of chapter 5, we have what is commonly considered to be one of the most difficult, one of the most challenging passages perhaps the most challenging passage in all of the New Testament, and that's the contrast of the heads, if you will, the head of death and the head of life, Adam versus Christ. And what Paul is showing us here, A, in verse 12, is that sin's consequences always, always extend beyond the sinner. They always extend farther than the sinner thinks they will. It doesn't matter what the character of the sin is. It doesn't matter what the isolation of the individual committing it is. The consequence of sin never affects only that individual. How so? Let's, let's, let's create, let's construct a little scenario here. Here is Joe Blow isolated by himself on a desert island. He is the only living soul on that island. How could his sins, some would say, how can he sin in that scenario? But in the mind, how could his sins affect anybody besides him? There's no one else there. Who else can his sins affect? God. 
What is the essence of sin? Sin is an offense against God. Where that individual is, God is present, even if no one else is there. So the consequence, the impact, the effect of sin always extends beyond the individual, even when that individual is alone. But more especially when that individual is not alone, but is part of human society. So at verse 12, uh, therefore, just as sin came into the world through one man and death through sin, so death spread to all men because all sin. Notice what he does not say. In verse 12, as death came into the world through one man, that's Adam, and death through sin, because as a consequence of sin, so death spread to all men because one man sinned. Paul could just as easily have said that, couldn't he? But our Calvinistic friends are misreading this to make it say that. The consequence of Adam's sin spread to all men. How so? <laughs> that down, the, down the street here, across the highway, there's a hospital. What's the hospital there for? Because people get hurt and people get sick and untreated injuries and sickness have the potential for what? Physical death. They can kill you untreated. That hospital is there because physical death is in the world. Physical death is a, an unintended consequence of sin. Did Adam understand what death was in the garden? He'd never seen anything die, as far as we know. What did Genesis 2 verse 17 say? In the day that you eat this fruit, you shall surely die. You can eat anything else you want in the, uh, of the fruit in the garden, Adam, but don't eat this one. You shall surely die. How did Adam die that day? He died spiritually. He was, his fellowship with God was broken because of the issue of sin. How did Isaiah describe that? Sin does what? Isaiah 59 and verse 2 separates it creates a, a gulf a break a, a a rupture in our relationship adam's relationship with god was ruptured that day by his sin but the consequences of sin don't stop there what else happened in the year of the flood who died adam seemingly 930 years old He died physically as well as spiritually. Now, in Christ, that spiritual death can be redeemed. And there's no reason for us to assume that Adam continued estranged from God without hope. Everything else we read about him seems to imply he made a pretty good life outside of the garden in terms of his relationship with God. Physical death passed to all men. But notice what else. Death spread to all men because all sin. Spiritual death spread. Not because of what Adam did, but because of what we do. So, in verses 13 through 19, you have a contrast between Adam's sin and Christ's atonement. And in verse 17, again in verse 19, you have this expression, much more what happens. Adam's sin had consequences that spread far beyond him. But so, do, so did Christ's death have consequences that spread far beyond him. He did not simply balance the scales, as it were, pay the penalty. What else did he do? In his life, he provides us hope. And so there is the statement then at verses 20 and 21, God in his grace far surpasses in his remedy for sin the impact of sin in this world. 
Well, that brings us to chapter 6. In chapter 6, at verse 2, we'll come back to verse 1 in just a minute. But in verse 2, you have this, this statement, this really, uh, as one writer calls it, a ringing declaration uh, in chapter 6, verse 2, that really ought to forever lay to rest the idea that somehow sins that Christians commit don't count, that, that God's grace will automatically somehow excuse us from guilt for sin. Look at chapter 6. The English Standard says in verse 2, uh, God forbid, how shall we who have died to sin still live in it? Now the English Standard says by no means in this case. Some of the newer translations render this certainly not. The King James, the New King James, the American Standard, God forbid. Well, the name of God doesn't actually appear there, but the emphasis, the, the emphatic statement is very present. Paul is, is unequivocal, makes no bones in stating that Christians absolutely cannot tarry in sin, cannot continue in sin, because in becoming children of God, what are we supposed to do in that process? How shall we who have what? Died. What is death? Exactly. Separation. Our world, thinking only in physical terms, tends to think of death as cessation of life. How do we uh, judge physical death, typically? How do we recognize physical death, typically? Well, the heart's not beating anymore. Uh, the, the, the blood is not being pumped around carrying oxygen. The, the lungs are not inflating and deflating. There's no pulse. Maybe we put electrodes on the head and, and, and there's no brain wave. Life has ceased. No. Life has moved away from this realm. Existence, awareness is still present. It's just not present in this physical shell anymore. It's now entirely on the ethereal plane only partially as we exist right now. It's not confined by the physical shell or the husk of the body. Paul makes the point, if we're Christians, what have we done? We died to sin. That means we're not supposed to continue in it. That death is supposed to take place in what we describe as what? The watery grave of baptism. Well, so that we can be raised from spiritual death, spiritually separated from God, to spiritual life, spiritually joined with Him through the blood of Jesus. If we continue in sin, though, that takes us back to chapter 6, verse 1. What effect does that have? Well, that uh, basically that nullifies everything that Jesus died to accomplish. That makes His efforts on our part a waste. Uh, notice how the Holy Spirit's imagery here helps us to understand the action of baptism. It's compared to a, a burial in, in verse 4. That shows us why the idea of various modes of baptism as the denominational community and as your Webster's Dictionary would describe, immersion or sprinkling water or pouring water on somebody's head. How many of you have seen uh, my big fat Greek wedding? I know all you ladies have. And you see the guy uh, joining her Greek Orthodox church to satisfy her family. And how is he baptized into the Greek Orthodox church? Well, he puts on a, a, a I guess, a pair of swim trunks, a diaper, something, stands in a wading pool, and what does the Orthodox priest do? Pours water on his head. And that's supposed to constitute baptism. But right here in Romans 6 and verse 4, Paul, as if the word itself, doesn't in its original Greek tell us what it means. Baptizo means to submerge, to immerse. It has nothing to do with sprinkling or pouring. Both have Greek cognates or, or Greek uh, correspondence for those words. But as if the very meaning of the word is not enough, Paul describes it in verse 4 as what? 
A burial. A burial. You don't bury something by sprinkling a little dirt on it or by pouring a, a spoonful or even a shovelful on it. You cover it up. The very idea of different modes of baptism is, is a contradiction in terms. It's ridiculous on the face of it. But go down to chapter 6, verses 16, 17, and 18. And there, this in, in by way of overview in 16, 17, and 18, Paul emphasizes the role of personal choice in our spiritual condition. Now, this cuts both ways. No one is a slave to Satan against his or her will. No one is a slave to Satan except by choice. He has zero power to compel us or to control us unless we allow him to. Our own choices, our own actions determine whether we'll be faithful servants of God or miserable slaves of the evil one. And there's no other person who can make that choice for us. But just as with all such decisions, we have to acknowledge every choice we make has what? Inescapable consequences. There is a word that our modern society would like to banish from human awareness. Consequences. We, we want, in our modern world, uh, it seems that we want to live as if there are no consequences to our decisions. And yet, go, go jump off the roof, and I promise the law of gravity will enforce on you that there are consequences. I walked out the door a minute ago forgetting that there is a step right at the door. And I'll tell you what, the law of gravity very nearly re renewed my awareness of that. I stepped down about six inches farther than I planned to go. But I caught myself before I sprawled face first onto the porch. From a secular perspective, one of the most controversial statements in the whole book of Romans comes here in chapter 6 at verses 22 and 23. What does Paul do there? He points out that Christians have been set free from sin for what purpose? So that we can become voluntary servants. Now, the Greek word that's used here, the word doulou or doulos, can be defined or, or translated as servant or bond servant, what we would tend to think of as an indentured servant or slave. It can properly be used in all three contexts. What usually is ignored in this context is the fact that this servitude, dare we say this slavery that Paul is talking about in Romans 22, 6, 22, and 23, is a voluntary servitude it's the grateful response of someone who has received the gift of holiness, the blessing of holiness, sanctification, and eternal life. The alternative down here in verse 23 is permanent separation from God. The wages, the paycheck of sin is what? The deserved consequence of sin is separation from God. But the free gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. One who serves by choice is not a slave in the worldly sense of that word. One who serves God by choice is a truly free person. Now, jump into chapter 7 briefly, and, and we'll survey 7 and 8 just briefly, and then go back and, and look a little more in depth at chapter 6 and 7 and time permitting chapter 8. But as Paul describes in chapter 7, the, the actions and the shortcomings of Moses' covenant, what he calls the law here, what we tend to think of in our uh, parlance as the Ten Commandments, which is sort of shorthand for everything associated with the Mosaic covenant. In chapter 7, as, as Paul is describing this, he gives one of the clearest definitions you'll find anywhere in the Bible for what law actually means. You look at chapter 7, and in verse 7, law 
is what defines and identifies sin as sin. What shall we say? That the law is sin? By no means. Yet, if it had not been for the law, I would not have known sin, for I would not have known what it is to covet. If the law had not said, you shall not covet. That's a simple illustration. But in addition, he goes on in verse 8 and says, where there's no law, what else? What's the result? There's no law. There can be no sin. Sin is identified by law. Though because the law is, is what identifies what sin is, it also specifies the penalty for violating God's law, for engaging in sin. What's the penalty there at, at, at verses 9 and 10? Spiritual death, separation from God. In verse 11, it's sin, not the law, that causes condemnation, causes spiritual death. The law itself is holy. It's righteous. It, it's good, verse 12. Uh, in, in one sense, you could argue that the law, in, in a sense, is morally neutral. It simply is an identifier. It separates what's good from what's evil. But that in itself makes it good. Humanity's problem with sin, our problem with sin lies in our unwillingness to obey God's law. The problem is not a, a flaw or a shortcoming in the law, verse 13. Now, how does our world, how does the 21st century deal with such things? We, uh, to, to borrow, uh, I think it was Daniel Patrick Moynihan who first used the expression publicly, we deal with sin by doing what? Defining deviancy down. We just keep reclassifying, redefining as okay one thing after another, after another, after another, that the law of God long ago identified as wrong, sin, offensive, a violation of God's design, of God's will. Now come down to verses 14 through 20 in chapter 7. And Paul there gives us a, a description that, that all of us really could probably relate to very well. He, he describes the constant conflict that we all experience in knowing the right thing to do while experiencing the temptation and the desire to do the wrong thing. Now, what does James tell us in James 4 and verse 17 about that? Therefore, to him that knoweth, to do good, and doeth it not, to him it is sin. James put it in, boy, James shorthanded it, just put it in a, a succinct form. You know the right thing to do, and you don't do it, you blew it. Paul, in verses 14 through 20, makes it very personal. Wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of sin? As long as we're obedient to the law of sin and death that he describes in verse 23, uh, Ezekiel explained that back in Ezekiel chapter 18, verse 4 and verse 20, the soul that sins shall die. The father does not bear the iniquity, the guilt of the son. The son shall not bear the iniquity of the father. Don't hold the son responsible for what the father did. Each one shall bear his own sins. As long as we're obedient to the law of sin and death, then we stand condemned before God. What's the law of sin and death? Well, real simple. You sin, you die. Sin has consequences. We can try to banish consequences all we want, but that does not change the facts. Coming down here today, I got behind a little car in, in uh, I believe it was in Griffin as we were going along. And, you know, I'm cursed in a sense that, that when I see words printed, I read them. Well, this car had a little sticker on the back of it and it had some words on it so I had to get close enough to it at a stoplight to be able to read those words and I, I boy it fits perfectly with what we're talking about it said the fact that you're offended doesn't make you right the fact that you're offended doesn't make you right in our 21st century world the fact that that people are offended that there is a God who has a standard of right and wrong 
on which they're on the wrong side of it. It's not good grammar, but you know what I mean. The fact that folks are on the wrong side of God and are offended that God would sit in judgment on them does not make them right. Well, that's what Paul's talking about here at the end of chapter 7. As long as we're obedient to the law of sin and death, then we're condemned before God. But the corollary to that is that when we serve the law of God, we're delivered from that law of sin and death, and we can give thanks to God, verses 24 and 25. And he summarizes this whole point in the beginning of chapter 8 at verse 2 by pointing out that we're freed from the law of sin and death by what? By the law of the Spirit of life in Christ. Now, Take a quick look into chapter 8. Whether we'll get that far tonight, I don't know. But in chapter 8, in verses 6, 7, and 8, we have an inspired definition of true spirituality. Now, it starts out, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus, for the law of the Spirit of life has set you free in Christ Jesus from the law of sin and death. But now jump down here to verse 6. For to set the mind on the flesh is death. But to set the mind on the spirit is life and peace. For the mind that is set, focus, on the flesh is hostile to God, for it does not submit to God's law. Indeed, it cannot. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God. You've got an inspired definition there of what true spirituality is. Now take your Bible and flip back to Jesus' words in John chapter 6. And in John chapter 6, at uh, verse 60, when many of his disciples heard what he said about the bread that came down from heaven and about uh, his blood and, and so forth, they said, this is a hard saying. Who can hear it? Who can listen to it? Who, who can understand it, basically? Who can digest this? But Jesus, knowing in himself that his disciples were grumbling about this, said to them, do you take offense at this? Then what if you were to see the Son of Man ascending to where he was before? It is the Spirit, verse 63, who gives life. The flesh is no help at all. The words that I have spoken to you, the words are spirit and they are life. Those who are in the flesh cannot please God, but those who are in the Spirit, what's the corollary? That's the definition of pleasing God. According to these verses, Spirituality is neither a feeling nor is it defined by a specific list of actions. Now I want you to focus on that for a minute. Have you ever met someone who described themselves as, well, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual? What did they mean by that statement? I don't go to church or I'm not part of some kind of organized religion. But what about this, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual. What does that part mean? Okay, so, so maybe, maybe by that they mean, well, I, I, I recognize that there is a higher power, but I'm just not particularly interested in, in uh, doing anything Specific. You know what that statement, I'm, I'm not religious, but I'm spiritual, really is? That's a cop out. Say again? It's a subjective statement. What that person is saying is, in essence, I feel satisfied with me the way I am. And since I feel satisfied with me the way I am, well, I feel like God ought to be satisfied too. But spirituality is not a feeling. Spirituality is not a specific list of actions. Do this, 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 and you will be spiritual. No. A person is not spiritual because of how frequently they pray. A person is not spiritual because they maintain a, a serene approach to life. 
A person is not spiritual even because of how frequently they introduce the Lord's name into common conversation. Oh, thank you, Jesus. Thank you, Jesus. No, that does not define you as a spiritual person. Spirituality is defined right here as having one's mind set, having one's mind focused on the things of the Spirit and submitting to God's law. Verse 7. A person whose mind is focused on the things of this world or someone who will simply not fully submit to the law of God, verse 8, is by definition not Tell him to take it back. We'll we'll get one. I beg your pardon? Just tell him to back and get it. We don't like it. We don't want it. And so we'll just go tomorrow. I told Fran I'd take it tomorrow and get one. Get the feeling I'm hearing one yeah. half of a phone yeah. conversation. Yeah. Okay. Part of Romans chapter 8. You don't want to put your food in Verse 28 you know. is very often lifted out of its context. In moments of spiritual distress and difficulty, all things work together for good. All things work together for good. Well, you know, this 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 is a bad situation, but you know, the Bible says all things work together for good. This this was a horrible tragedy, but you know, the Bible says all things work together. Oh, this this was just a terrible, terrible experience, but well, something good bound to come out of it. That's not what Romans 8, verse 28 says. The two points. To not overlook that are crucial to the truthfulness of this statement that all things work together for good. Point number one is that Paul's words, Paul's statement here in chapter 8, verse 28 is conditional. It's not a blanket statement. It's conditional. All things only work together for good for those who love God. What did Jesus say in John chapter 14, in verse 15? If you love me, <laughs> keep my commandments. If you love me, keep my commandments. Folks who don't keep the commandments of God, what can we conclude about them? They don't love him. But second, point number two, God's working of all things together for good, even hardships and, and heartbreaks and, and even evil experiences, that's only accomplished for those who are called by Him. That is, those who are called according to or in conformity with His purposes. Now, how are we called by God? 2 Thessalonians 2 and verse 14, we're called by the gospel. We're called by his word. You look at verses 29 and 30, and Paul goes on to explain the how of God's calling. You know, we, we probably, every preacher at some point in life, every preaching student at some point in life, hears the old joke about the, the young man that, that uh, gets religion and, and decides, I think maybe the Lord is trying to tell me to, to go and preach. And so he goes to the, to the local preacher or to the to the, the director of the school of theology, and he says, I, I think I've got a calling from the Lord. Well, well, what, what do you mean? I think I'm supposed to preach. Well, what do you mean? Well, I was out plowing and and, and, and I was out in the in the field and I looked up in the clouds and I saw letters form and it said G P C. And I think that means go preach Christ. And the preacher looks at him and says, Are you sure that doesn't mean go pick cotton? Or go plow the corn, or what have you. Here in verses 29 and 30, Paul explains the how of God's calling, and it's not some mystical experience. Look at Romans chapter 8, verses 28, 29, and 30. We know that for those who love God, all things work together for good. There's that conditional statement. If you love God, now if you don't love God, all things don't work together for good. Sometimes they work together. They combine for more evil. For those who called according to his purpose. For those whom he foreknew, he also predestined to be conformed to the image of his son in order that he might be the firstborn among many brethren. 
and those whom he predestined, he also called. Colossians chapter 3 and verse 15 speaks to this as well. He also called, and those whom he called, he also justified, and those whom he justified, he also glorified. It has nothing to do with how I feel. Now the closing paragraph, verses 35 through 39 in chapter 8, presents one of the New Testament's most encouraging, most motivational exhortations. And the whole object of the exercise, the whole point, is to emphasize that there are absolutely no, zero external forces that can separate a child of God from the Father. There is no power on this earth that can separate you against your will from your Father. Despite the challenges that you may encounter, the hardships that you may face, you and you alone are the only person who has the ability to separate yourself from the Father. Now you take your Bible, flip over to 2 Peter chapter 2, and notice what Peter says there in verses 20 and 21 and 22. <clears throat> 2 Peter chapter 2, Peter writes to these uh, brethren, and he says, if after they have escaped the defilements of the world through the knowledge of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, after that, if they are again entangled in them and overcome, the last state has become worse for them than the first. For it would have been better for them never to have known the way of righteousness than after knowing it to turn back from the holy commandment delivered to them what the true proverb says has happened to them. The dog returns to its own vomit, and the sow, after washing herself, returns to wallow in the mire. So, if we choose to remain faithful to God, as we should, there is no power on earth. There is no power exercised in this world that can prevent us from carrying out that decision. It's all on us. All right, let's go back to the beginning of chapter six now and, and make a, a few more detailed notes now that we've kind of surveyed through the section to where we need to, to end up tonight, Lord willing. What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Well, this is a reasonable, logical question in a sense, given what Paul has just explained in chapter 5. What did he just explain in chapter 5? We're justified by faith. Our faith has made us whole in effect. Adam introduced death into the world Spiritual death through sin, but part of its consequence was also what? Physical death that still exists. Jesus Christ answered the, answered the problem of spiritual separation from God by balancing the equation, as it were, paying the penalty with what? His own blood. But much more than that, he didn't simply solve that problem so that we're simply back on an even keel. He's given us hope in his life. If he's able to do so much more in redeeming us than Satan was able to do in separating us with sin, if the grace of God abounds much more than the impact of sin, shouldn't we continue in sin so that Grace may abound. In other words, if, if sin has these deadly consequences, but God's solution is so much more, so much better, so over the top, above and beyond the consequence, well, shouldn't we sin more that, so that there'll be more grace? Shouldn't we just continue to increase the amount of grace in the world? Now, that's a very, <laughs> that's a very 21st century way of thinking, isn't it? Let us do evil that good may abound, as it were. 
should we reason like that? God forbid, verse 2. Absolutely not. But what shall we say then? Paul introduces this with, with a, a debater's question, a, a debater's phrase. What shall we say then? How shall we deal with this, this subject of justification by faith? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Here's a, a rabbinic formula, question and answer. Here's the question. Now, figure out the answer. It's a methodology of, it's typical of rabbis. Paul is using a very traditional Jewish uh, manner of teaching in this. Uh, not exclusive to them, but very common. Shall we continue? Shall we stay? In He's basically asking, should we just dwell in sin? No. It's not a, a, a hortative subject. So, uh, some, so. I'm sorry, I washed my tongue this morning and I can't do a thing with it. It's not a hortatory or a hortative subjunctive. It's, it's, he's not saying, let's do this. He's saying, this makes no sense to reason like this. Don't do this. God forbid. It, it, it's, it's not, that's a worldly way of thinking. That's Satan's reasoning. What did Satan do with Jesus in the face-to-face -face temptations? In Matthew chapter 4, if you're really the Son of God, command these stones to become bread. If you're really the Son of God, throw yourself off the, the pinnacle of the temple and let the angels catch you. If you're really the Son of God, uh, bow down and I'll give you all these kingdoms. Never mind that they all belong to him in the first place. You know, that's the way Satan always works. He offers you what's already yours as if it's not. But here shall we continue in sin that grace may abound. No. Why not? Why not? To whom is Paul writing? What kind of people are the recipients of this letter? Christians. Who are Christians? What defines a person as a Christian? Faith in God? Trust in God that they've they've repented of sins, a, a reformation of life. What else defines a person as, as having become a Christian? They they own that decision, don't they? They they own it publicly. I believe they've made the good confession. What else? When does one come out of being in sin and into being in a relationship with Christ? We're baptized into Christ. As many of you as have been baptized into Christ were baptized into his death, Paul says to the Galatian Christians. Galatians chapter 3. What's the significance of baptism? <clears throat> to partake in the resurrection? To, to, to jointly participate? with the Lord in his resurrection. What else? Peter describes it. First Peter chapter 3 and verse 21. He says it's, it's not merely a ritual cleansing, not the putting away of the filth of the flesh. What is the action of baptism? It's the, it's, it's the response of a good conscience. It's, it's an action that shows a good conscience. How does Ananias express it to Saul of Tarsus? In Acts 22. Saul, what are you waiting for? Get up. Be baptized. And do what? What's the effect of being baptized in that circumstance? Wash away your sins. Appealing to or calling on the name of the Lord. Same word, by the way, that Paul himself uses when he appeals to Caesar. How shall we who have died to sin continue any longer therein? Paul is writing to Christians. It's absurd 
for any child of God to, to even entertain the thought, well, you know, the more we sin, the more God gives grace. So, so you know, if God's grace is so much more than the, than, than the problem of sin, maybe we ought to continue to sin so that grace just multiplies, multiplies, multiplies in the world. That's not how it works. That's an absurd thought. That's ridiculous. It makes a mockery. And that's the point Paul is making here. It makes a mockery of what God is seeking to accomplish. God forbid. How shall we who have died to sin continue any longer therein? Jump forward in chapter 6 for a moment. Look again at verses 16, 17, 18. What, how, how does Paul describe the relationship between the sinner and Satan? Back up to verse 16. Thanks be to God that whereas you were what? Servants, slaves of sin. You became servants of righteousness. When the slave dies, he is no longer the property of his master. He no longer serves that master. When the slave to sin dies to sin, he no longer serves sin. Shall we continue sinning so that grace may abound? Are you nuts? You have died to sin. You're not part of that relationship anymore. Sin is not your master. Why would you want to continue doing that? You pick up here. Do you not know that all of us who have been baptized into Christ Jesus were baptized into his death? What's the significance of baptism in the death of Christ? All we, as many as were parallels Galatians 3 and verse 27 here. Baptism into Christ Jesus is a figure for union with Christ. To be joined, connected to Him. Uh, go back to Jesus' own words in Matthew 28. In giving what we typically call the Great Commission, what did He say? Go into uh, Mark says go into all the world, but Matthew records it. Go therefore and do what? Make disciples, teach all nations, baptizing them how? What, what's the phraseology that Matthew records? In the name of the Father and of the Son and of the Holy Ghost or the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all things whatsoever I have commanded you. And behold, or lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the earth or the end of the age, until time is no more, basically. To be baptized into the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit is to be baptized into fellowship with the three persons Father, Son, Holy Spirit, of the Godhead. All we who were baptized into his death, identified with him in that way, who received the benefits of his death. When Jesus died, what happened? He died to sin. How so? He never sinned, but what did he experience throughout his time in this world? Say again? Well, he certainly experienced the impact, the, the consequences of human sin. He experienced temptation as well. He identifies with us because 
he experienced everything we experienced. The distinction is he did not ever, even once, surrender to that temptation. And because he did not, he then could offer himself, his life's blood, in place of all of ours, which is the due penalty for our sin. But when he died, that penalty was paid, and his connection, his relationship, if you will, to sin was severed. Romans 8 and verse 3 tells us that he came into this world in the likeness of sinful flesh. That is, experiencing everything we experience subject to everything that we're subject to. Luke chapter 15 and verse 1 tells us he ate with sinners. He associated with, he rubbed shoulders with those who were condemned because of their own choice to sin. Matthew chapter 4 verses 1 through 11 shows us face-to-face -face temptation, as it were, with Satan himself. The three temptations there that, that so many have pointed out correspond to John's words in 1 John chapter 2, verses 15, 16, and 17. Lust of the flesh, lust of the eyes, and pride or vain glory of life. But lest we think that was the only time he was tempted, just flip over to Hebrews chapter 4, and what do you find there in verses 15 and 16? We, Christians, do not have a high priest who cannot be touched or who can't relate to the feeling of our infirmity. To, he can't relate to our situation. Our, our high priest can. How so? Because he was tempted in all points, just like we are. Yet he did not sin, unlike us. Now, how are we tempted? This is... Tuesday, September the what, 12th, I believe, 2023. It's 7.14 p.m. Eastern Daylight Time in the evening. How many times have you been tempted since you woke up this morning? Now, maybe you slept in. It's a Tuesday and you didn't have anything else to do. So maybe you slept in until 4.30 this afternoon and so you've only been awake a couple of hours, so you haven't been tempted a whole lot yet. Or maybe you've had one of those days where you woke up at 5 o'clock this morning and couldn't go back to sleep. And from the moment your eyes went, Boing! you've just met one temptation after another temptation after another temptation after another temptation. And you've had to decide on an hourly or maybe a moment-by-moment -moment basis sometimes during the course of today. No, I'm not going to do that. Hebrews 4, in verse 15, tells you Jesus had those days too. Jesus was tempted just like we are. Day in and day out, sometimes hour in and hour out, sometimes moment after moment after moment. Yet he did not sin. The death of Jesus was both for sin, 1 Corinthians 15, verse 3, and unto sin, chapter 6, here in Romans and verse 10. You look at chapter 6 and verse 10. For the death he died, he died to sin once for all, but the life he lives, he lives to God. He's no longer tempted. He's no longer subject to temptation. When we're baptized into his death for sin, we're accepting him as the atonement, the atoning sacrifice for our sin. That applies that sacrifice to our benefit. 
and a consequence of that is we receive forgiveness of our sins. But the corollary to that, we're committed from that day to responsibility from that day forward until the time that we depart this world. We're buried. Verse 4. The old man of sin is buried as far as sin is concerned. We're buried with baptism by means of. That's an action word, a verb. It refers to a specific action. Until we've gone through the motion of that specific act, that burial, until that moment we have not obeyed God. At that moment, we have. We have completed the beginning or begun the end, you might say. It's 7.15, 7.17 actually. It's time to take a break. So we will pause here until 7.32 and then we'll pick up in chapter 6 once again. We might actually make it into chapter 7 tonight. Who knows? <clears throat> I hear you, Mike. I have no hope. <laughs> okay, 732. Time for us to pick up and go again. We're in Romans chapter 6. We come to verse 5, and verse 5 begins a new paragraph. If we have been united with him in a death like his, English Standard rendering here, we shall certainly be united with him in a resurrection like his. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order that the body of sin might be brought to nothing so that we would no longer be enslaved to sin. The one who has died has been set free from sin. Now, if we have died with Christ, we believe that we will also live with him. We know that Christ, being raised from the dead, will never die again. Death no longer has dominion over him. For the death he died, he died to sin, once for all. But the life he lives, he lives to God. So you also must consider yourselves dead to sin and alive to God in Christ Jesus. If we have become united with him in the likeness of his death, verse 5, that is, we have grown together with him. We have, have become and we still are like him. A fundamental change has taken place. Our relationship with sin was terminated. Uh, we became possessors of all of the blessings that he gained for us in his death. Think about that for a minute. We now possess blessings that he made possible. There's an implication of burial in baptism. His death, his burial are conceived as a single act and they stand opposite his resurrection. When would you bury something? When it has died. He died. The burial was a natural part of that equation. Resurrection stands as a contrast to that. We're buried into death to sin. And our resurrection, the newness of life, cannot be separated from that. That had to take place so that we can be raised to walk in newness of life. The old man was crucified with him. Verse 6. We know that our old self was crucified with him in order to this purpose so that we can live like him. The old man is the old manner of life before baptism, the prior life before becoming a child of God. Crucified, what is crucifixion? What's the object of crucifixion? Say again. You, not me. The object of crucifixion. What, what, what is crucifixion designed to do? Kill someone. There you go. I, I, I'm, I'm sorry. When you said you, it, it didn't register what you were, what you were driving at there. Crucifixion was conceived as 
in theory, the most agonizing, painful form of taking someone's life that could be imagined. It, it, it is literally dying by degrees, you might say. Uh, in the administration of crucifixion, the longer the suffering could be prolonged, the more successful the crucifixion in, in the eyes of some. The object was to inflict the, inflict the maximum amount of suffering possible prior to death. And Paul says we were crucified with him. He endured the maximum amount of suffering, not for one individual, not for two, not for ten, but for all. To what end? To what purpose? That the body of sin might be done away that which is controlled by sin might be done away. Rendered inactive, if you will. Now, go over to 1 Corinthians chapter 13 for just a minute. <clears throat> we think of 1 Corinthians chapter 13. That's the what chapter of the Bible. That's the love chapter of the Bible. And it does talk about love. Gives us all the qualities and characteristics of love, but in its larger context, what's Paul talking about in this chapter? This really ought to be chapters 12, 13, and 14 ought to just be chapter 12, one great big long chapter, kind of like Psalm 119. What's Paul actually talking about in this context? Spiritual gifts, their abuse, and their proper use, and the fact that they were what? temporary. So you look at 1 Corinthians chapter 13 and what does Paul say in verse 8? Prophecy was done away. But it did not mean that those prophecies spoken would be ineffective or fail to be fulfilled. It means the act of speaking as the Holy Spirit gave the words would cease. Why? Because that which is complete finished, full-grown, mature, teleos, perfect, would arrive. And the need for that which is partial, incomplete, uh, dare we say infantile, immature, knowing partially, prophesying partially, that would be done away. The Old Covenant, according to Second. Corinthians chapter 3 and verse 11 was to be done away, not destroyed. What did Jesus say in Matthew 5 and verse 17? Do not think that I came to what? Destroy. I didn't come to destroy, but to do what? To fill it up, to, come, to, to, to reach the brim, as it were, so that it could hold no more. To finish it, to complete it. The old covenant was to be done away, not destroyed, but finished so that it no longer has authority over us. In the same way, the body of sin, the body controlled by sin, by desire, is to be destroyed, not ceasing to exist, but ceasing to be controlled by sin. No longer in bondage. No longer enslaved. What's controlled by sin is enslaved to sin. Just look down to verse 12, verse 13, verse 16. But Christians should be no longer controlled by sin. He who died is justified, verse 7. Set free, the English Standard Version says, from sin. We could talk about physical death here. An illustration of physical death. Uh, physical death, that man no longer sins. He has died. He's no longer subject to temptation, much less opportunity to sin. We who have died to sin should not continue in sin. Uh, death to sin takes place when? When we're baptized into Christ. It's in line with the context to say so. Verse 8 seems to continue the same thought. 
and connects our death with Christ. But what's the effect of it? We're justified. Justified from sin. Held acquitted. Cleared. Now, am I innocent of sin? No. Am I guilty of having sin? Absolutely. But my penalty has been paid. And that justification takes place simultaneously with death to sin. Death takes place in the burial of baptism. Now, if justification takes place when I die to sin, and I die to sin when I am buried with Christ in baptism, so that the result is I can be raised to walk in newness of life, when am I justified? At what point does that take place? Am I not justified when I am baptized into Christ? When I am buried with Him in baptism? If death to sin took place at the point of repentance, then justification would have to take place at that point. And it would be impossible if I'm already justified to baptize me for the remission of sin. But what did Peter say to those assembled Jews in Acts 2 on the day of Pentecost? What shall we do, men and brethren? All of you repent. Collective pronoun, all of you repent. And every one of you individually be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ unto, in order to obtain, in the direction of what? Remission, forgiveness of your sins. If we died with Christ, being baptized into His death, verse 8, we shall also live with Him. How so? He died and lives again. If we're united with Him, what does that say for us? We live again, a new life. He's raised from the dead and sin no longer has dominion, no longer rules over him. Well, now how? <clears throat> how did sin ever have dominion over him? In what sense? He lived in this world in a fleshly body, which means what? In practical terms, he experienced every consequence of sin that goes with life in this fleshly body. He did not sin, so he did not experience the guilt of sin, but he experienced the consequences in this world of sin, did he not? Was he ever sick? As, as a child, did, did, did he have measles or mumps or, or childhood sicknesses? I don't know. But he was, it behooved him to be made like unto his brethren. Do we experience? Childhood sicknesses? And where do those things come? Is that not a consequence of sin in the world? Did he ever experience injustice? You have a demon. That's what the rulers of the Jews said about him. He casts out evil spirits by the power of Satan. Satan. 
By the power of Beelzebub. No. That was false from A to Z, wasn't it? But what was the root of that false accusation? The presence of sin in the world. He suffered the injustices of others' sins, though not their guilt. Now that he has died, how do those things relate to him now? Look at verse 9. Sin, death, the consequence of sin, no longer has dominion over him. His relationship with it has been permanently terminated. His relationship with death, his relationship with sin as the cause of death. He does not go through this act over and over and over and over again. Well, how does that impact us? As Paul is writing to us, assuming we're Roman Christians. Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? God forbid! Absolutely! Are you crazy? How can we, who have died to sin, continue in it any longer? You can take your Bible and, and, and draw a, a line from verse 2 to verse 9 and connect these two thoughts. If we have died to sin, what impact does that have for us or should that have for us? Not supposed to have dominion over us. Not supposed to be able to rule over Sin is not supposed to be able to govern our existence in this world anymore. How did sin ever govern our existence in this world? Go back to chapter 3. Verse 9, verse 10, verse 23. All responsible, accountable people, folks that are old enough to recognize and, and distinguish, all have sinned and come short, fall short of the glory of God. Well, what comes with sin? Consequences, separation from God, death, lack of hope, certainty of punishment, of condemnation. You see, when I sin, I, I, I'm, not, I'm not cut off from God just in the here and now. If I continue in that condition, I'm cut off permanently. All right, for the Ephesian Christians, Ephesians chapter 2. And he describes their situation before Christ. What was their condition, these heathen people, before Christ? You were alienated from the commonwealth of Israel. You weren't Jews, so you didn't have that relationship with God. But you did sin. So not, not only were you cut off from the commonwealth of Israel, but you were what? without God in the world. And how does he describe that condition? You were dead in trespasses and sin. You had what? No hope. Zero. But in Christ, The fear of death, the prospect of forever separation from the Maker, doesn't hold have any hold over us any longer. The fear of death is no longer the motivating factor; should no longer be the motivating factor in our lives. 
Jesus doesn't go through that act of dying over and over again. Neither should we. We have died to sin. We don't have to die to sin again. We've already made that decision. We've already made that choice. We've already made that commitment. Are we still subject to temptation? Yes. But does that govern us? Nope. Whereas you were the servants of sin, you became servants of righteousness. We'll get to that in a minute. Verse 10, he died to sin once. Epa, ep, epa, epa pax. <clears throat> epa pax. Hard for me to say for some reason. Once and only once. He died one time. He doesn't have to do it again. You go to Hebrews chapter 9 and verses 26 and following, and, and the writer of Hebrews makes the same point. Not once upon a time, but one time for all time. He lives unto God. <clears throat> no longer lives uh, as he did before death. Look at verse 10. The death he died, he died to sin. Once for all. The English standard gives us a good rendering of the Greek idea there. One time for all time. But the life he lives, he lives unto God. Lived in a different sphere with a different purpose. And ours ought to be the same way. So you must consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. Copy him. In other words, you were bond servants. You were slaves. John chapter 8, and verse 34. You were in the kingdom of darkness. Colossians chapter 1 and verse 13. But now, if you're a Christian, where are you? You were in darkness. Now you're in light. You've been translated, Colossians chapter 1, into the kingdom of his dear son. Kingdom of God. We're in Christ Jesus, Ephesians 2 and verse 13. Paul writes to, to the Corinthians and says in 2 Corinthians 5 and verse 17, you're a new creation or a new creature in Christ. You have a new purpose, a new aim in life, verse 9 of 2 Corinthians 5. You have a, a new relationship. Christ is your bridegroom. So we come to chapter 8 and verse 1, and what does he say? In that new relationship, there, there's no condemnation for those who are in Christ Jesus. Now, I, I realize we just jumped from the middle of chapter 6 to the beginning of chapter 8. We'll come back to chapter 6 in just a second. But look at chapter 8 and verse 1. There is now therefore no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus. Does not say... As a Christian, you can't ever get lost again. It does not say, now that you're a Christian, you can just sit back, kick back, take it easy because you can't ever get lost. You're, you're fine. You can coast. You're on the glide path for heaven. That's not what that says. So, account yourselves, verse 11, consider yourself dead to sin and alive to God. All right, now look at verses 12 through 14. If you are dead to sin and alive to God, what does that mean in practical terms? Don't let sin reign in your mortal body. What kind of relationship does sin seek to have with any person in that person's life? Satan only wants one place in your life. He wants the throne. He's not interested in sitting beside you with you on the throne and, and just whispering in your ear. He may persuade you that that's what he wants to do, but he wants exactly one spot, the throne. And who to whom does the throne belong? By right. It belongs to God. It belongs to Jesus Christ. Do not let sin reign, rule, dominate, control in your mortal body. Sin is viewed as the master and the body as the abject slave in this context. But what do we know about the body? 
Go back and look at verse 12 again. Let not sin, therefore, reign in your body. But there's a key word there, isn't there? Your mortal body. Your temporary existence. Your, your capable of dying body. That you should obey the lusts thereof. To make you obey its passions, the English Standard Version. Don't let sin have that kind of influence. Do not, he goes on, present your members to sin as instruments or tools for unrighteousness, verse 13. But present yourselves to God as those who've been brought from death to life and your members as instruments for righteousness. Don't do what you used to do. Before I was a Christian, how did I live? Johnny Ramsey used to describe the pre-Christian life as living for Satan, sin, and self. And in reality, that's living for Satan, for Satan, and for Satan. Except it's not living for him, it's dying. Pointlessly, needlessly, hopelessly, futilely. And you don't have to. Present your bodies to him. Flip over to chapter 12 for just a moment. Romans chapter 12. And notice the appeal that comes back around and plays on this idea in chapter 6. I appeal to you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, to do what? Present your bodies as living sacrifices, holy and acceptable to God which is your reasonable service. English Standard here, I think, does a disservice in saying spiritual worship, more in line with the RSV and the NIV. But nevertheless, Paul is coming back to this idea. God reigns in the life of the Christian. How? with us, only by our choice to allow him to reign. He does not force himself upon us. So we come back here, present your bodies. This, this, is, this is our responsibility. He's not going to take from us what he's given us. Go over to Ephesians chapter 5 for just a moment and look at the passage that the, the uh, skeptical and angry feminist community most despises in all of Scripture. Ephesians 5 verses 22 and following. And what instruction does the Apostle Paul, the Holy Spirit through the Apostle Paul, give to wives in that passage? Do what? Say, say it again. Submit as unto the Lord. Okay, read down to about verse 24, 25, and he speaks to the husbands, and what does he say there? Husbands, love your wives how? Like Christ loves the church and gave himself for it. You keep reading from 22 to 33, and somewhere in there, I just know that there's a verse that says, you husbands, beat your wives into submission. You make them do what you want them to because they have, they're your slaves. It's there somewhere. The feminist community tells me it is because the Bible is misogynistic and full of, of, of hatred and bitterness toward women. It's all about patriarchy. 
It's got to be there somewhere because they say it is. I'm about to go off on a tangent, so let me get back over here in Romans. Here's the point. What does Ephesians 5 and verse 22 say? And to whom does it say it? It says, why? You give by your choice, not by force, not, not by compulsion. You give by your own choice to your husband. Submit yourself. You give yourself to him. Now, the corollary to that husband, you better love that woman the same way Jesus loved the church. How much? He gave himself up. He sacrificed himself. That's, that's, that's big, big love. What does that have to do with Romans 6? Romans 6, don't let sin reign in your mortal body, verse 12. Do not present your members as servants for uh, instruments of, of unrighteousness. Present yourselves to God. God's not going to force you to be faithful. God's not going to force you to be a Christian. You know, if there were no other passage in the Bible on the subject, Romans 6 and verse uh, 13 answers the whole Calvinistic idea that God chose some people to be saved and they can't get lost and God chose other people to be lost and they can't get saved. Predestination in the Calvinistic concept. Because what does this tell us? Present yourself to God. Who's doing the presenting here? God is not presenting you to himself. He gave you the ability to choose. And he wants you to choose him. So, uh, sin shall not have dominion. It shall not reign over you. It's a parallel to the idea of sin not reigning over Christ. Death not reigning over Christ, rather. Uh, it, you, are, you shall not be ruled by it. But notice, you're not under law, but under grace. That is, you're not under law for the purpose of being justified. You, you have to. In the study of hermeneutics, which is the science of interpretation, the rules, the principles of accurate interpretation, we have to take into account context, the setting in which something is said. Now, I, I don't remember if I've done it in this particular class or not, but to illustrate that point, let me use a simple three-letter English word. Hit, H-I-T. What does H-I-T mean? Say again? Okay, it has several meanings. Is it a verb or a noun? Okay. It depends exactly. Thank you, Eddie. It depends on the context. Now, if if we're talking about uh, using the using it in the typical first understanding verb meaning of the word hit, that's exactly right. To strike something, but we can use that same basic concept in an entirely different setting where it is related to that meaning of the verb. But you bring it over into the sporting world in baseball, and now when the bat strikes the ball and the ball lands in fair play territory, what has the batter got? He's got a hit. But wait, there's more, like the guy on the obnoxious commercial says. Bring it over into the realm of theater. And when you have a successful Broadway play that doesn't close the same night that it opened and makes back more than the backers invested in it, what have you got? You've got a hit! 
It depends on the context. Here, sin shall not have dominion over you. Why not? You're not under law. Most of Protestantism wants to read that statement, you're not under law but under grace, as there's no law anymore, all there is is grace. You know why that doesn't work? Exactly. If there's no more law, there's no more sin. If there's no more sin, you don't need grace. Grace and law are not exclusive of one another. The one, grace, is dependent on the other, law. You can't have grace without law. Because without law, there's no condemnation. Without condemnation, there's no need for grace. There's no need for forgiveness. You're not under law, but under grace. You're not under law for the purpose of being justified. What, what's the whole context of Romans? I'm not ashamed of the gospel of Christ. For it, the gospel of Christ, is the power, the tool, the instrument of God unto salvation. For therein, in what? In the gospel which is the tool, the instrument, the power, of the, the implement God uses for salvation, in it is revealed what? The righteousness of God. From faith to faith, or for, for the purpose of faith. So that the just shall live by, what's the key word? Faith. The just shall not live by righteousness under the law. Go back to chapter 5. For a righteous man, not very many people willing to take that deal. How about a good man? Uh, maybe a few. God did something that we can't conceive of apart from God. He made it possible for the sinner to be justified. In Jesus Christ. You're not under law for the purpose of being justified. We're justified under the law of Christ. But the, the as a rule of life, we the justified are under that law. But we're not justified by law. How are we justified? By faith in Jesus Christ. The law, if it were the basis of justification, commands. And demands, it, it imposes requirements on us. It pronounces approval on whom? Only the one who obeys perfectly. Ah, hello. Who's that? Jesus. Uh, it, it pronounces condemnation on everyone who commits an infraction. Every infractate, you might say. Uh, who's that? Hello. That's us. It exposes, convicts of sin. It gives Satan, sin, an advantage. That's chapter 7, verses 9 through uh, 13, and chapter 4 and verse 15. It can do nothing to justify one who has committed sin. It does nothing to relieve the bondage caused by sin, gives no hope, no encouragement. You know, James in James 2 and verse 10 says, whoso keeps the whole law yet offends in one point is what? Guilty as if he committed, uh, uh, offended in every point. All right, follow this out for just a second. If I stumble, I didn't even set out to do it on purpose. But I stumbled, Galatians chapter 6. I was overtaken in a fall. Just one seemingly minor thing. Where am I? I'm lost. If I'm lost, 
No hope for redemption. No Christ. In for a penny, in for a pound. What, what, what is there to hold me back from going whole hog in sin? I can't get any more lost than lost. We're not under law, but under grace. Law gives no encouragement for righteousness to one who is already condemned by it. It actually destroys hope when it's misunderstood. And that was what the Pharisees did with the law. They misunderstood it and took away hope. Because they recognized condemnation, but not hope in Christ. So, come on down through chapter 6. What then? Are we to sin because we're not under law, but under grace? Not at all. Not so. God forbid. By no means. That, do, do, do we just take the day off? From righteousness? No. Nope. That's not how this works. Why not? Well, verses 16 and 17, you are the servant, slave, dare we say, of whomever you choose to serve. Whose choice is it? It's yours. It's not Satan. It's not God's in a sense because he does not enforce that on us. To whom you present yourselves as obedient servants, his servants you are. The one whom you obey. Sin unto death or obedience unto righteousness. But thanks be to God. Why? Verse 17. You were this, servants of sin. You became this, servants of righteousness. How so? You made the choice. You made the choice. Paul was not thankful that they'd been servants of sin, but the fact, but, but for the fact that even though they had been, they'd chosen otherwise. They no longer were so. You've obeyed from the heart. That is sincerely an act uh, prompted by the heart. Well now, let's think about the, the biblical heart for just a minute. What, what's involved in the biblical heart? You obeyed from the heart that form of teaching, the standard of teaching to which you were committed. What's involved in the biblical heart? Intellect. They knew what they were doing, didn't they, when they obeyed? The, the intellectual part was involved because what were they doing? They were doing what they were taught in the gospel. But what else is involved in the biblical heart? Emotion. Go back and look at verse 17. Thanks be to God that you who were once slaves of sins have become obedient from the heart to the standard of teaching to which you were committed and having been set free from sin have become slaves of righteousness. They obeyed from the heart and we recognize in that what? Emotion, an expression of, of love appreciation, gratitude for God and, and for Jesus Christ. What else is involved? You've got intellect, you've got emotion. <laughs> Conscience, recognition of right and wrong, and willpower. The determination to choose what's right. They express their will in obedience. The gospel is designed to appeal to the scriptural heart. Well, what's the old saying that the, the older preachers used to use? The Bible contains what? Facts to be believed, commands 
to be obeyed and promises, depending on who it was that said it to be received or promises to be enjoyed by those who believe and obey. The gospel is designed to appeal to the scriptural heart. It contains facts and truth that appeal to the intellect. The promises and the warnings appeal to the emotional aspect of man. And it has instruction, commands, dare we say, that direct the will, the willpower. That form of teaching, that form of doctrine. The pattern of sound words, 2 Timothy chapter 1 and verse 13. Those things that God has revealed to us. And what's the result? Made free from sin. Now, this verb in verse 18, you were made free, that's that's an, an uh, aorist past participle. This took place, and this is the result. There was a time in the past they obeyed and were freed, and they continue free because they became servants of righteousness. Well, what did Jesus say in the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew 6 and verse uh, 24 thereabouts? No man can do what? Serve two masters. All right. You were the servants of sin. You became the servants of righteousness. There are not two masters in the life of a Christian. Should not be. They ceased to serve Satan. And began serve Christ. But go back to that statement, Matthew 6, for a minute. No man can serve two masters. He will either hate the one and love the other or hold the one and despise the other. You cannot serve God and mammon. Materialism, worldliness. Why can you not serve God and mammon? Because God will not accept your service on that on the terms. He does not want half hearted service or even 99% hearted service. Think, think about walking on a fence rail. If someone holds your hand on either side to keep you balanced, could you walk on a a fence rail or a tight rope or a high wire or something. Somebody to keep you perfectly balanced. Yeah, you could. But if God lets go, you're going to fall off on Satan's side. And God will not hold your hand in that scenario. He wants you entirely on his side or not at all. You were the servants of sin. You became the servants of righteousness. I speak after the manner of men. Verse 19. It, it figures of speech that, that people can relate to. Common uh, illustrations because of your natural limitations. Just as you once presented your members as slaves to impurity and lawlessness, leading to more lawlessness, in the same way that you did that, give that same dedication, you might say, to righteousness. Now present your members as slaves to righteousness that leads to sanctification. Here's the whole point, Paul says. Take that energy and direct it to God. When you were servants of sin, you were free in regard to righteousness. That is, you were not subject to righteousness. You were not yielding to righteousness. But what what fruit, what benefit did you have? What good results from sin? None. Now, someone will say, wait a minute. I fathered this child out of wedlock, and that was sin. But look at the blessing I have in this child. 
that child is the result of my sin, so good came from sin. No. Good came from God's law of procreation. Every seed bears according to its kind. Nothing good came from the sin. Sin separated you from God. What fruit did you have in sin? None. Things that you're ashamed of, the end of those things, the destination of those things is death. Now that you've been set free from sin and become slaves of God, the fruit you get leads to sanctification. And the destination of sanctification is what? Eternal life. For the wages of sin is death. Sin begets eternal death. Permanent separation from God. Words mean things, as, as one radio pundit used to say again and again and again, and that's, that's absolutely true. Words mean things. And we're sometimes very careless in the way that we use words. We know what we mean, and pretty much everybody with whom we speak knows what we mean. And so we sometimes are a little bit sloppy in how we express what we actually mean. Take a hymnal sometime and page through the hymnal and look at all the different hymns and songs and spiritual songs that we sing that use the expression throughout eternity. Do you realize that throughout eternity is an oxymoron? Who are you calling a moron? There is no out in eternity. There is no through eternity. There is only in and in and in and in, and in, and in, and in eternity. The wages of sin is separated, 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 cut off, removed from, not seeing, having nothing to do with, never having even the slightest glimmer of hope of seeing God's face at face again. The wages of sin is death. The gift of God is eternal life. Forever with Christ Jesus, our Lord. Okay, we've got six minutes left. Look at chapter seven. Chapter seven introduces the idea of freedom from the law in verses one through six. At verse seven, down to verse 13, the law as it relates to sin, as it impacts sin in the life of one who is under the law. Now come to verse 14. We know that the law is spiritual. And that speaks of the nature of the law, not the part of the man to which the law is addressed. The law is spiritual the man. Not necessarily so. And then we see the complexities or the problem of the justified man. Verses 14 through 25. He needs sanctification. On the basis of the law, he has no hope. So, 
look at the first paragraph here. I'm speaking to those who know the law. For the law is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Now there's there's something significant here in the first statement. In our English Bibles, we typically read most translations, I'm speaking to those who know the law. That's not what the Greek text says. I'm speaking to those who know law. In other words, those who, who understand the concept, who, who get the idea of law. Generic. Now let's make the specific application that the law, there is a definite article there the second time, is binding on a person only as long as he lives. Don't you know this? The law applies only as long as that person lives. Well, now what law is he talking about here? He illustrates it in verse 2. A married woman is bound by law to her husband. How long? As long as he's alive. When he dies, she's not married to him anymore. Victorian standards and mores notwithstanding, it's said that uh, Clarence Day's mother in her old age after his father had died uh, took a tour of Egypt in the uh, 1890s, I believe, early 1900s. And when she came to Pharaoh's tomb and, and, and uh, learned that Pharaoh had been married and then had, had uh, that woman died and he married again, took her cane in her old age and began to strike the sarcophagus and say, what about the feelings of your first wife? Well, the wife is bound by law to her husband so long as he lives. But after he dies, she's released from the law of the husband, the law of being married to him. She's no longer his wife. He's no longer her husband. She is free to be married to whom she wills. But if she marries another while he's still alive, what's the word for that? He's an adulteress. Now, what's the application in verses 4, 5, and 6? You died to the law. Whom do you suppose Paul is actually addressing here in the church at Rome in chapter 7, verses 1 through 6? Those Jewish Christians who were struggling to grasp that their justification was not based on their adherence to the law. Their justification did not rest in Moses, but in what? In whom? In Christ. And it's not based on their, their meticulous observance of their traditions, it's based on their faith in Christ. You also have died to the law through the body of Christ so that you may belong to another. How did they die to the law through the body of Christ? It wasn't what, it was not what they did. It was not by becoming Christians. It was by what he did. I came not to destroy but to fulfill. Colossians 2 and verse 14. The handwriting, the bond written in ordinances. What did he do with it? It was nailed to his cross. Why was it nailed to his cross? He fulfilled it. What took place on the cross? He was sacrificed. He gave himself. Despising the shame of the cross, he gave himself, laid down his life for us. That took this, which could never justify them in the first place, out of the way. It removed an impediment given for their benefit that they put in their way in their relationship with God. 
so they're freed. You died to the law, not through anything you did, but through what Jesus did. So that you can be joined, belong to another. To him who has been raised from the dead. So that we can bear fruit for God. Now, contrast, previous life, verse 5, prior life, while we were living in the flesh, passion aroused by the law, that was at work in our members to bear fruit for death. But now, we're released from the law. See, in verse 4, Christ releases from the law. In verse 5, here's our personal problem. Verse 6, here's our part. We're released from the law, having died to that which held us captive. To what purpose? We were discharged. How so? So that we can live, serve in the new way, the way of the Spirit, and not in the old way of the written code. Not in the oldness of letter, nature of service, before our marriage, if you will, our joining with Christ. State 32. It means it's time to stop. We got a little bit of a late start tonight. We got a little bit of a late conclusion, but this is a good place to stop. We did actually get into chapter 7, just not very far. Questions, comments, thoughts, complaints, objections, all of it. Complaints and objections go to Dave Domain. Questions, comments, all that uh, I'll do my best with. Very well. Thank you very much for being here. Appreciate your time and your attention and your participation.